Okay, so tonight we are discussing the 12 great feasts. And just to keep us um, in some kind of a system, I'm using the list on page 170 and 171 of the book just to keep us on track in terms of which feast uh, we're going to speak of. We're going to speak of the 12 great feasts in the order they appear in the church year. And if you remember from last week, the church year begins when? September. September 1st. Very good. Before we do that, I want to. I'm going to pass around this. This is an um, absolutely fantastic resource if you're interested in the deepening your knowledge about the twelve great feasts. It is a book called "The Feasts of the Lord: An Introduction of the Twelve Feasts and Orthodox Christology" by Metropolitan Harothios. Uh, I'll pass it around so you don't worry about writing it down right this second. Fantastic book. And it has pages and pages per per feast, plus some great things about just the theology of the church. So uh, something that if you're interested in it, um, maybe we could just simply coordinate a special order maybe in the bookstore. But it's a fantastic book if you're interested in learning specifically about the 12 great feasts. So, we begin. Now, if you remember from last week, we talked about the calendar, and we spoke about movable things and immovable things, yes? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, we'll begin. Most of the things we're going to talk about tonight, 12 great feasts, most of them are immovable. They are stationary feasts placed on the calendar. Anything associated with Pascha becomes movable. Pascha is not one of the 12 major feasts. Pascha is what's called the Feast of Feasts. It is in a category of its own. So the calendar begins on September 1st, and the first feast we find is the Nativity of the Theotokos on September 8th. Why do you think we celebrate that as the first feast of the year? Anybody? Absolutely, she is the Theotokos, the bearer of God. And if life is about getting to heaven, and heaven is about being in communion with God, who is Jesus Christ, right? God couldn't have become man without the willing participation of a woman. And so we begin the year right away celebrating her birth as a way of saying, Finally, the new Eve has been born. And from the new Eve, we will have the new Adam. And there we'll have the new life, the new creation. So right away we celebrate the nativity of the mother of God. Because without her birth, he wouldn't have had a mother to come into, into the world through. Okay? Quite naturally important thing. Yeah? I'm sorry, you said that. James Russell was saying to me one time, was like, was I akin to die? And I said, no, I die as my husband. I'm not akin to him. And he said, I said, well, maybe really everybody's related because of Adam and Eve. And he said, Adam wasn't Greek. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Adam wasn't Greek. If Adam were Greek, he'd still be waiting for something because he's always late. So, <laughs> so <coughs> now, what is so important about this feast besides the fact that it's the coming into life of the mother of God why is that so important theologically her parents were old and sterile like other miracle births and they were uh, what's what I'm looking for uh, they were shunned now in the Old Testament if you didn't bear children you were being punished for something but her parents Joachim and Anna were in fact righteous they were able to have a child which they in thanks to God had agreed of course to dedicate the Virgin Mary to the temple so her birth is not only a miracle of these two old people who weren't having children but it is also what a testament that she is in fact a human being because if she was not a human being born like everybody else what could Christ not have been human mm -hmm. because Christ takes his human flesh from Mary so this feast is very important for the Christology for understanding who Jesus Christ is that his mother was born as a woman born regular through regular childbirth 
through husband and wife coming to know each other and, and bringing forth a child. And so that's the first feast we see in, 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 the, in, the, in the new year. Okay? Now, the second feast, only a week later, is the Feast of the Cross, the Elevation of the Holy Cross, September 14th. And this is a fasting day. I mentioned that, I think, last week. Why? Because the cross is both joy and sorrow. Joyful sorrow in our tradition, you can't have joy without sorrow. So, since the, Christ, since the cross is a feast also of life and death, we have the feast but it's a somber feast, so we also have a fasting day, and it's a strict fast day. I like to think of it this way. Here we are, we are <coughs> driving on Interstate 20 toward Atlanta. And as soon as you get out of town, one of the first things you see are mile markers. Uh, Columbia, 80 miles, right? So immediately as you depart your journey, if you're headed for Colombia, you know where you're headed. You're headed to Colombia. We begin our journey in September, and immediately the church places a signpost, the cross. This is where we're headed. We are headed straight to the cross, because the cross is the focal point of our, of our life. Whoever desires to follow me, let him pick up his cross daily and follow me. So it's as if the calendar is reminding us the purpose of the, of, the, of the whole year is the passion of Christ and our daily sacrifice to God. When you say a strict fast, what do you mean? Uh, again, if again fasting is its own levels based upon individuals okay. and where you are. Okay. Uh, at the strictest level, September 14th is a day where you should be eating only raw fruits and vegetables. Uh, you and mean it's raw one day. Too? Yeah. So everything. No, there was nothing cooked. Right. Okay. Nuts and berries. Yeah. The most basic human diet that exists. Okay. And that's again, if you remember fasting. We'll, we'll talk about fasting separately. But mm -hmm. uh, now some people can't do that. But uh, that's the ideal for that particular day. All right. Now, uh, it also interesting on this day is the readings for the day of the readings of the crucifixion. So it is actually a commemoration of the crucifixion of Christ right there in September. Now that's going to become important when we get to transfiguration in the summertime. So just remember that. That the readings for the Feast of the Holy Cross in September are the readings from the, from the crucifixion of Christ. All right. So it's there as our guidepost, as our starting point for the year. The next feast we encounter is the presentation of the Theotokos on November 21st. By church tradition, Joachim and Anna, the parents of the Theotokos, when she was a little girl, brought her and gave her to the temple. Uh, remember I said that they were going to present her originally? Well, according to tradition, they didn't... They, they wanted some extra time with her. So finally, by the age of three, they brought her to live at the temple. And she went in from the age of three and began living at the temple. We might say, using uh, our contemporary terminology, a temple virgin. Okay? Now, this is important for multiple reasons. First of all, she was a holy woman living every moment of her day at the temple. But also, this helps verify her virginity. Because in the Jewish tradition, when Joseph's wife died, Joseph had children. And part of the custom was then that he needed a wife to take care of his children. And as the virgins of the temple came of age, they were then betrothed to men such as Joseph, who needed wives. And this is how... Mary became betrothed to Joseph. Remember, Joseph was an old man. He was a widower. So the fact that she grew up at the temple from the age of three, which is what this feast uh, commemorates, is further evidence that she was a virgin and that uh, she was betrothed to Joseph for a particular purpose and that she was not just simply some young girl he found uh, on the street. 
it also becomes important that in the in the tradition of our understanding with the of the life of the Theotokos, that uh, she regularly was seen speaking with angels, and uh, we'll say as a parenthetical statement that when she spoke with Gabriel at the Annunciation, it was as if they knew each other. There was a conversation because she was that holy and of course God foreknowing uh, what his plan was knew who she was she was uh, would be in life and so she was lived that holy life at the temple so all of that is part of our commemoration on November 21st so we hold out now look see remember we're talking about Christ and the Theotokos excuse me but what is the constant theme why is her feast important? Because what it reflects in Christ. Okay. Everything that is important about the Theotokos is important because of how it reflects Christ. Because how Christ is reflected is to whom we are united in our baptism, and therefore it becomes important. All right? The next feast now we have is the Nativity of our Lord Jesus Christ on December 25th. Most scholars agree that Christmas was not originally in December. It was probably sometime in spring. But the church didn't want to celebrate Christmas at the same time as celebrating Pascha. And so it sought for a suitable place to celebrate the birth of Christ. And it picked Christmas for a couple of reasons. It, it picked December 25th for a few reasons. Part of it is the symbolism of light and sun. Christ is light of the world. And at the <coughs> winter solstice, what happens? Of course, in the northern hemisphere. This is not the case in the southern hemisphere. But since this was all established for northern hemisphere people... <laughs> <laughs> we have to kind of forget about the south, southern hemisphere for a moment. So what happens at the winter solstice on December 25th? Actually, 21st, but on December 25th? It is the shortest day of the year. Which means afterwards, what happens? Light is coming into the world and getting more and more and more light. So we celebrate the coming of the light into the world. It was also a conscious effort to replace the pagan feast of the solstice. Fine, you want something to celebrate? We'll give you something to celebrate. The coming of the true light. Okay. And so literally, as, as if they were offering a, for lack of a better word, a competitive option, the true feast as opposed to the pagan feast, and this is um, common within the, the the growth of this the growth of Christianity because what even in the Jewish feasts Christ renews the feast and we have the true feast now, and so that's fine. You want to celebrate light? We'll give you the true light to celebrate, and now we have Christmas, of course, on December twenty fifth. Uh, I should have made your thought. Okay. Now that period, that feast is uh, preempted by a 40-day fast. So from November 15th through Christmas is a Lenten period in our church. Remember last week we spoke about preparation, celebration, preparation, celebration. So the first big preparation period is this 40-day Lenten period. We call it Advent as well. The Protestants have the Advent period where we are fasting in preparation for Christmas. And it is a 40-day daily fast just like Great Lent is, but it's not as strict. And this preparation, of course, culminates with the celebration of Christmas on December 25th. And then a period of celebration between Christmas and Epiphany, there's no fasting. January 5th is the next day that we fast. So we fast December 24th, and then we don't fast again until January 5th is a strict fast. 
So is that the 12 days? That's the 12 days of Christmas. We've heard that song, right? On the 12th day of Christmas, right? And that's, it doesn't, it's not 12 days ending with Christmas. It's 12 days beginning with Christmas. And something that I think that we can offer society as a Christian people is to return to the understanding that Christmas Day is the beginning of the celebration and not the end of a season of exhausting parties at work, shopping, all the various holiday activities that take place now beginning in October in some places. They get to Christmas, they barely celebrate Christmas because they're too exhausted. So we actually have something we can offer society. Wait a minute. Especially in the conversation of returning Christ to Christmas. Why don't we return preparation to celebration? Where we're getting ready to celebrate Christmas. And then boy, we celebrate it for two weeks. Okay. I mentioned last week when we talk about time that the hymns are always in the here and now. So, just as a reminder, I want to just bring that into our into our memory. So, for example, in the Feast of Christmas, the hymn starts, Today is born in a cave. So, that idea that it's right here, right now happening, it's not just a historical event that, uh, that we're commemorating. Okay? The next thing we have, January 6th now, is Epiphany or Theophany, depending on how you uh, want to translate the word. It is Theophania, but the hymns also say Epiphania, so it's an either or expression. It is the baptism of Christ, but it, the reason it is called Theophany or Epiphany is because God has revealed himself to us in the Trinity. And so at Christ's baptism, what do we have? We have Christ. We have the dove, representing the Holy Spirit, and we have the voice of the Father. So we have at that event a revelation, an epiphany of who God is, a theophany, a revelation of God. Okay? It is uh, a major feast of the church, important feast, because it celebrates... Christ's beginning of his public ministry and also the importance here is we bless the waters why do we bless the waters on on, uh, on Epiphany because when Christ was baptized he entered the water the creation the creator of the universe now fully enters creation because what is the one thing that all life on the face of the earth requires? Water. And so by God being baptized in the water, it wasn't God that was sanctified by the water. The water became sanctified by God entering it. And by sanctifying the water, what did God do? Sanctified all creation. So we celebrate the blessing of the waters as a way to further perpetuate the blessing of creation. So what do we do? We bless our homes. We bless our businesses. We bless the property at the church. We bless each other. Right? It's that constant renewal and blessing of life that happens in the presence of, of God entering the water. Yes? Okay. Then we have on February 2nd, the presentation of our Lord which is the 40 day blessing of Jesus Christ and that is in fact 40 days after Christmas why is this important Christ says I did not come to I came not to break the law but to fulfill the law all Jewish boys were, were uh, had their 40 day blessings and Christ did everything according to the law okay so he was presented to the temple at 40 days. And who was he greeted with? But Simeon the high priest. Simeon who had received a vision. Before you die, you're going to see the Messiah. And that's why we have the, the, uh, the hymn of Simeon. 
Lord, now let your servant depart in peace according to your word for my eyes have seen your salvation which you have prepared in the presence of all people a light for the revelation of the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. So here is Simeon holding on to this baby whom he now knows and declares to be the Messiah. Very important feast. Okay. Is that why? Isn't there something? Oh, we're gonna get this confused. So, isn't there yeah. something about your when your child is born, bringing them to church? We are, we are, and and now, following this, we still do a forty day blessing to this very day. We bring the child to the church on the fortieth day. Okay. Now, by uh, today's standards, we. We, it has become customary to find the Sunday closest to the 40th day. Uh, and that makes sense because the 40 day blessing of the baby today is not as much a blessing for the baby as it is the blessing for the mother. It's welcoming the mother back into the community so that she can receive communion. So it doesn't make any sense to have a 40 day blessing on a Tuesday afternoon if there's no liturgy. Because you're welcome. And the prayers even say, so that she may receive your mysteries, O Lord. So it makes sense to have moved it to a Sunday, um, but we're trying to keep it as the, the Sunday closest to the to the forty days. Next, March twenty fifth, the Annunciation by Gabriel that the Virgin Mary is going to become the Mother of God. And you'll see here this, by the way, just to note that the the various scriptural passages that that uh, correlate to these feasts. As I said, Mary knew Gabriel, we, we, according to tradition, because of her time at the temple. And this feast is nine months prior to December 25th. A, fe a, f a full, perfect gestational period. Now, the reason I say perfect is because we also celebrate the conception of the Theotokos and the conception of St. John the Baptist but we don't celebrate those exactly nine months we celebrate John the Baptist one day short of nine months and the Virgin Mary one day past nine months only Christ is celebrated in a, as a perfect gestational period again a theological statement in the calendar of the, of the church itself which I think is pretty cool Okay. And uh, what is so important about the Annunciation of Christ? That God is coming into the world, taking on human flesh, without the participation of Joseph. In fact, in the story, Joseph is confused. Oh my goodness, what happened here? I didn't know her. And as the Bible says, he agrees to put her away quietly. He agrees to quietly divorce her. And God says, just, just a minute, Joseph, take it easy. What she has is of the Holy Spirit. It's a good thing. Go on. You're going to call his name Jesus. And the story goes on, right? So uh, this, I think, is, is, is very important to keep in mind. That this event verifies the conception of God. And in our 2009 reality... Why would that be so important? Think outside the box, taking our faith into the church, into the society. Life begins at conception. We're celebrating the actual conception of Christ, the conception of God. And we dare in today's society to abort fetuses just because a woman doesn't want to have a baby please so again we can take our spiritual tradition about the importance of life bring it to society and re-sanctify the true essence of life in society life begins at conception we also know this because shortly after the conception of Christ where does Mary go? she visits her sister Elizabeth, her cousin Elizabeth Elizabeth is pregnant with John the Baptist and what does John the Baptist do? 
just hearing Mary's voice, John the Baptist leaps in her womb for joy. And Mary had just conceived Christ. So it was a pretty, um, pretty substantial event in the understanding of the, of, of the value and holiness of life. The conception of Christ. Okay? And just as important is, as Christmas, if he was not conceived, of course, as a human being, then uh, he, if he did not take flesh, we would not be saved. So it's, it's trying to remind us of that consistent theme there. All right, now we're going to vary a bit. Now we have a few feasts that are movable feasts. And remember I said anything that has to do with Pascha is... Uh, floats around the calendar for Pascha. Now, the first thing that we see that is one of the 12 great feasts is Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday is the Sunday before Holy Week. I'll say that again. Palm Sunday is the Sunday before Holy Week. It is also the Sunday after Great Lent. Now you should be wondering, how can that be? Well, Holy Week is not part of Great Lent. Great Lent actually ends Friday night before the Saturday of Lazarus. The Saturday of Lazarus is a feast, and Palm Sunday is a feast of the Lord. Then Sunday night begins Holy Week. So the reason I say that is because Pascha is uh, preempted by the great fast. But we're fasting for more than 40 days. You know, people say, well, we're fasting for 40 days before Easter. That's not true. We're fasting, I believe it's 56 days before Pascha. Because if you back up, you have the entire week of Holy Week is its own unique period in the church. Then you have Palm Sunday. Then you have Saturday of Lazarus. Then you have the 40 days of the Great Fast, which includes five Sundays. Then you have the weeks of pre-Lent, of the Triothion period. So we actually have uh, seven full weeks of fasting. Plus Holy Week, I think, if, if, I have my, if my math is correct. I'm trying to do it in my head. I should have written it down to be sure. So we don't have four days. So this whole period is a preparation for Pascha. And in the middle of that, we have Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday is Christ's triumphal entrance into Jerusalem as the King. You will see in Scripture, there are te several times that the Gospels refer to Christ being called the King and he always rejects the title or he escapes or he moves away now when he comes in in Jerusalem because he's finally ready to declare to, to take his throne now he no longer rejects the accolade, accolades of the, of the crowd Hosanna is he blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord and they're throwing down palm branches which is a, is a royal symbol, right? The emperor would get the palm branches as he came into town. So this was a declaration of his royalty, and finally now he doesn't turn it away. <clears throat> uh, of course, it's also a prophecy in Scripture that he comes on a, on a donkey, um, but we won't, get in, we won't get into that tonight. So that's the Sunday before Pascha is Palm Sunday. Then, I, remember I told you that Pascha is not one of the 12 great feasts. It is in its own category. Then we have 40 days after Pascha is the Feast of the Ascension. We know from Scripture that Christ walked the earth for 40 days. And on the 40th day, after He said goodbye to His disciples, what happens? He's lifted up into heaven in the clouds. And the apostles are standing like this. Now what are we going to do? Huh. 
Look, it's gone. What are we going to do? What is an angel saying? While you're staring into heaven, this same Lord will return in the same fashion he was taken away. Meaning, when he returns, he's going to be riding on a cloud and everyone is going to know that he's God. There'll be no mistake the second time. There'll be no mischaracterizing who he is the second time. Okay. But, what is important about this feast is in his ascension to heaven, he takes our humanity with him. And remember, I've said this before, that our salvation rests in what? The work of Christ in uniting humanity to divinity. That act is not finally realized until he ascends into heaven. And that's why he says that he who first descends must ascend. And our humanity now, our human nature, is where? At the throne of God. Wow! That's what this feast is all about. That God became man, as St. Athanasius says, so that man could become God. In a real sense. Not part of the Trinity, but actually partaking, by the grace of God, a free gift, in the divinity of God, and so scripture says that man partakes by grace of what God is by nature, divine. And this is finally fully realized in the ascension into heaven. Where Christ takes humanity and goes up to heaven with it. So we as human beings are now in heaven. At the throne of God. On the throne of God with the person of Christ. Humanity is there. Now you tell me what religion in the world allows a mere created human being to touch God let alone actually join himself to God where the creator of the universe allows humanity to be integrated into divinity there isn't one. Every other religion subjugates man. There's God and there's man. In Christ, we are united. We are in communion with the divinity of God. And that is finally fully realized in the ascension of Christ. Ten days later, which is 50 days after Pascha, we have the Feast of Pentecost. And again, this is a scriptural event where the apostles were celebrating Pentecost. Pentecost was one of those, remember I keep saying that Christ renewed the Jewish feasts and gave them new birth. So Pentecost was already a celebration of the coming of the law, the law of course coming from Moses. And so now the Holy Spirit comes upon the church and the Holy Spirit leads the church into all truth as Christ says. And so Pentecost is the coming of the Holy Spirit into the church to lead the church. This has an impact, I think, in our contemporary reality on multiple levels. First, if we believe that Christ is telling the truth and that the Holy Spirit guides the church into all truth, then we must believe that the ancient church, guided by those apostles who were there, that their guidance of the church was holy and completely true. And that has all sorts of ramifications in Christian history. Christians who today believe that right away mankind fell away from God's grace and ruined the church. And we keep seeing the apostles taught us to fast, they taught us about communion, they had the sacramental life that we have, they have liturgical worship, all the things that we are unique as Orthodox Christians is present in the Apostolic Church. And we can guarantee that it's true, otherwise God's a liar. And God don't lie. Either the Holy Spirit guides the church into all truth, or it doesn't. Either the Holy Spirit came into the Apostles on Pentecost, or He didn't. This is the feast that shows that he did. 
And what does it happen? They begin speaking in all the languages of the world. Not in some mumbo jumbo called tongues. Not in some gibberish. But in the languages of the world. That is very clear in scripture. When they say, who is this, a Galilean speaking in my language? If it was some gibberish, he would have said, what is he saying? Okay? So the speaking in tongues we see in, in Pentecost is the languages of humankind. And why? Because the apostles were charged, when you get the Holy Spirit, go to all nations in baptizing them. And so the Holy, the, the Holy Apostles received the gift of language. So what? So they could communicate the gift, the gospel. Many of us have the gift of languages. Some people are translators. Some people are not translators. You have the gift of language, some people, right? Some people can learn language like it's nothing. That's a gift of the Holy Spirit. Poured out on the Holy Apostles on Pentecost. I'm sorry I get excited because it, but it's just really cool to me. Then we have, uh, we end the summer in August. But before we get there, I just want to make a side comment about June. At the end of June, we, felt we celebrate the Holy Apostles. And I mentioned this last week. Just as a reminder that there's a, there's a fasting period, a Lenten period, that is uh, right before leading up to the Feast of the Holy Apostles. I just want you to, to remind you of that. After Pentecost, uh, the second Monday after Pentecost, which is the Monday after the Feast of the Holy Spirit, uh, is the beginning of this Lenten period. And it ends on June 29th. So it could be a couple of days. It could even be a day. It could be two weeks. This year is like a month long. Because this is now where we come back, as I said last week, and we get back together. Now we only have one calendar again, okay? So here we are in August, and the first two weeks of August, the four, first 14 days of August, is a Lenten period in the church. I'm going to speak with these two feasts together. Culminating with the feast of the Dormition of the Theotokos on August 15th, the death of the Virgin Mary, is preceded by two weeks of fasting. In that two weeks of fasting, is the Feast of Transfiguration. When Christ went on Mount Tabor, brought Peter, James, and John, and was revealed in his full, uncreated light to the apostles. Showing what? Showing that by the grace of God as a gift, we get to witness God in all his glory. What did the apostles say? How good it is for us to be here. And they built three altars. That event, we believe, if you look at what scholars tell us in Scripture, was 40 days before the crucifixion of Christ. Which would put it in the middle of Great Lent. And for the same reason of not wanting to have Christmas in the middle of Great Lent, the church did not want to have Transfiguration in the middle of Great Lent. And what I said about September 14th? August 6th is 40 days before September 14th. So, just like so we've connected it since September 14th is a is a is a commemoration of the crucifixion of Christ. August 6th is the transfiguration 40 days before the crucifixion. Pretty cool, huh? How we so easily connect the the dots in the so calendar. Who, did that? There. Who, who changed that? Well, the ancient church. We're talking about the, the first couple of centuries. It, it's, it's always been there. It's not in like the past hundred years. It's been. Right before. Yeah. The, with the, the fathers of the church in, in establishing the calendar, you know, uh, in the That's fourth century. Most of the stuff in the fourth century. The reading is between the, the calendars. Yeah. And, yeah. Mm -hmm. and this, and it, trying to understand that, it doesn't. Most of this stuff. Uh, it, that's that's associated with dates and when something gets fixed on a calendar most of it is in the 4th century when the church is, is is solidifying all of its commemorations prior to that things were very fluid 
we know, for example, in the calculation of Pascha, that in different parts of the world they were using completely different formulas. Uh, but in a re- in a desire to unite the church to celebrate Pascha at one common time in the fourth century, a formula was created said this is how we will all calculate Pascha, and so as part of, remember that's that coincides with the freedom of Christianity in the fourth century. Okay. Uh, so Transfiguration, of course, is our feast here at this church. Major event in the life of the church because it's another revelation of God. Okay? Uh, and revealing His willingness to, uh, to allow humanity to participate in His glory. He could have left the apostles and gone up on the mountain by Himself. But He brought the apostles. Why? Because He brings humanity... He invites humanity to participate in His glory. And uh, they were different from it. Those apostles were different from it. There is one um, understanding what Christ says. There are some here who will not see death until they see see God coming in His glory. Okay? And then uh, some some believe that that referred to the transfiguration, that those three men saw God in His glory at the transfiguration. Okay, so it's a really important theological understanding of our participation in our gift from God to be able to see Him and uh, and interact with the Creator of the universe. And then we end the year celebrating the falling asleep of the Theotokos, the death of the Virgin Mary on August 15th, we do in fact celebrate her death. She died. A regular human death on her deathbed. And it's required that she dies. Why? All humans have to die. Physical death. So she was dead. According to, according to tradition, St. Thomas missed a lot of things, I suppose, shows up late to her funeral. <laughs> <laughs> and they went to bring him to, to venerate her body on the third day, and she was gone. So we do not have her body. We use the term loosely in English, the assumption of the Theotokos in the Greek Orthodox, in the Orthodox tradition, to say that after she died, because of her unique role in the salvation of mankind, her body was resurrected right away, which is why it wasn't there when Thomas went to go see the body. The rest of humanity will have to wait for the second coming of Christ. So that understanding in the church is not a dogma of the church, not a can it, but it's, but it's a theological understanding that because of her important role, God honored her and resurrected her right away. But she did experience earthly death, the separation of body and soul. And that's important because that's what makes her human. Because if she's not human, then Christ is not human. This is why we as Orthodox have a big, big problem with the Roman Catholic theology of the Assumption. The Roman Catholic theology states that before death her body was assumed into heaven. that destroys our our humanity. All people die. Even Christ, as I've said, had to die in order to be fully human. Interestingly, the Roman Catholic Church didn't used to believe she... Let me start over. Interestingly, the Catholic Church used to believe she died. 
but because of the Roman Catholic doctrine of the Immaculate Conception which states that Mary was born without sin the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception does not refer to Christ's conception it simply states that Mary was born without sin if Mary was born without sin then she couldn't have died because perfection doesn't die that's why Christ had to be killed so therefore the Roman Catholic Church had to change its understanding of the Virgin Mary and say that she never did die she was assumed into heaven before her death I call that domino theology once one thing falls a whole chain of events of changes have to happen just to back up and keep that one change consistent and where does that lead us to today in the Roman Catholic Church the suggestion by many Roman Catholic theologians that the Virgin Mary is a co-redemptrix in Latin that she can actually participate in the salvation of humankind because well if she didn't she's almost subdivine so that's why I keep coming back to all of these feasts that we have for the Theotokos have always one thing in common their very celebration consistently proves the divinity of God of Jesus Christ and the humanity of Jesus Christ because if the Virgin Mary was not fully human then Christ was not human at all so we end the year with the emphatic statement of who the Virgin Mary was just like we began the year with the emphatic statement the Virgin Mary was a human being 100% the new Eve and through her God became human so that's the 12 great feasts we have preparation celebration preparation celebration preparation celebration and if like we spoke last week if we take those 12 great feasts and integrate them into our lives not just the theology that they explain but the lifestyle of the preparation and the celebration and the fasting and the, and the, and the and coming to the divine liturgies and things like that reading the scripture from the from the from those various feast days the hymns are amazing for those feast days you'll see in this book you'll see many of the hymns are like sermons about what we think about these about these feasts amazing stuff if you actually open up the service books of the church so our challenge in 2009 is to take the 12 great feasts and not just think about what they are but live them live the importance so when we see coming up in August the transfiguration of Christ we look at it and say okay how will this affect my life well would you not be a somehow affected if you came to a better understanding that the creator of the universe allowed you me measly human beings to gaze upon the glory of God if we truly lived that understanding in that feast wouldn't that affect how we live our daily lives we can't forget Orthodox Christianity is not just a mental exercise it is a way of life and that's why the ancient church was called the way before it was called the church because it is the way of salvation it is the way of life